Okay, so I think we're live now. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> I might just wait for a confirmation. Oh, thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen now. This is all very new, <laughs> as you can imagine. So I'm just going to share the presentation and then we'll begin. Can you refresh the screen? Because I don't want to keep it wrong. Right. Okay. So welcome, everybody, to the Domestic Violence and Abuse Research in Wales Prioritisation Workshop. Um, this is part of the Health and Care Research Wales conference that is taking place on the 7th of October um, and this is the first workshop. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm Bethan Pell, I'm a research associate in the Decipher Centre and Centre for Trials Research in Cardiff University. Um, I'm joined by Dr Rhiannon Evans and Dr Kelly mm -hmm. Buckley, who are going to introduce themselves briefly now. Yeah, shall I go? Yeah, so I'm Rhiannon Evans, uh, so I'm a senior lecturer at the Decipher Research Centre um, and I lead the programme of work around healthy social relationships. So there we focus on the health and well-being of um, children who have been exposed to domestic violence, um, children who are in care or where there might be um, issues within the family. Um, and we mainly develop and evaluate interventions to address these um, outcomes of mental health, health and well-being. Um, my name's Dr Kelly Buckley, I'm a research associate in Decipher um, and I work across several projects that all kind of um, sit under the umbrella that Rhiannon was talking about in terms of sort of healthy relationships, um, young people um, and abuse and violence. Okay, thank you both. Um, so as you heard, we've all, we've all kind of got a specialist interest in uh, domestic violence and abuse research. Um, so thank you so much for joining this workshop for what we hope is going to be an interesting um, and engaging workshop. So just to start, um, I just wanted to outline um, a few housekeeping um, things and ground rules. Uh, first and foremost, as you'll have noticed, we're on a virtual platform. Um, so there are a few sort of technical things that I just want to raise for you before we start. So we will be using Mentimeter. Um, this is a platform um, that we can use for our activities. Um, you may have had a chance to play around with this before, um, before this workshop today. Um, but if you don't have a device that you can use um, to participate in Mentimeter, you can still write in the chat um, uh, and use that function if you would prefer. Um, in the second half of the conference, we, uh, the workshop, we will be breaking out into breakout rooms. Um, in these rooms, you will be moving um, and um, this is just due to the, pl the platform that we're using. However, if you use the ask a question function, you can either ask the question, ask to speak, or you can uh, raise your hand, use one of the emojis to raise your hand, and one of us facilitators, uh, so Rhiannon, Kelly or I, uh, whoever is um, facilitating your breakout room will be able to unmute you to speak. Um, this means you'll have a chance to speak without disruption or interruption, any background noise or anything like that. Um, but we, we are really interested in generating a discussion. So if you are happy to speak, then it would be it would be great if you if you are happy to. But by all means, keep using the chat function and as facilitators will do our best, our best to keep on top of that and make sure everybody has their chance um, to have their say. In terms of ground rules, I just want to highlight um, confidentiality within this space, within the breakout rooms, um, whoever's speaking, um, be respectful of, of their views and each other's views. Um, and also a reminder to self-care, um, the nature of the topic that we're talking about, domestic violence and abuse, um, just, just means that we want to give you the self-care um, if anything comes up for you. We aren't expecting any, um, we're not raising any distressing content, um, but that's just for you guys to be mindful um, of that. So before we started um, just outlining the structure of the workshop, we wanted to uh, sort of give you our understanding and definition of domestic violence 
and abuse. And, and this is to give you a context um, for what we're going to be talking about and discussing. Um, I know that some of you do have already have an understanding of domestic violence and abuse, um, but this will just mean that we're all on the same page in terms of um, where we are. So domestic violence and abuse can be experienced by anyone, uh, that's regardless of their gender, sexuality, ethnicity or socioeconomic status. Um, and it's associated with physical and psychological impacts on the victim, but also um, on the children um, within the family. The government um, definition um, was actually expanded in 2013 to include those of ages 16 and 17, but also to include coercive control. So domestic violence and abuse is actually defined by the government now as any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive or threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members, regardless of gender or sexuality. And this can encompass, but is not limited to the following types of abuse, psychological, physical, sexual, financial, and or emotional. Uh, however, um, we at Cypher uh, feel like the definition actually goes broader than this. Um, and through the research in Cypher, through the School Health Research Network survey, um, it actually showed that domestic violence and abuse was quite prevalent in those who were 16 and under. Um, and so those young people um, are also um, experiencing domestic violence and abuse and as we move into the breakout rooms how we understand and define domestic violence and abuse can be something that we discuss further if if you so wish and feel like that's important to raise so how is the workshop going to work um, the purpose of this workshop is to set a future research agenda for domestic violence and abuse in Wales. Um, so we are going to briefly present um, three studies um, that address uh, domestic violence and abuse related issues in three different settings. These are the Jack trial, which uh, was based in secondary schools, the Health Pathfinder evaluation, which was based in healthcare settings, and Frida, which is based in third sector organisations. However, the purpose of this workshop is for us all to think collectively a bit more widely about how we should explore other areas um, to get the evidence that we need to inform and develop practice uh, to respond to, to domestic violence and abuse more effectively in Wales. So after we've explained our current uh, three research priorities, we'd like, we will ask you to come together in the three breakout rooms to think about this more widely. But before we started, we wanted to get a little bit of an idea of what you already think might be important to address in domestic violence and abuse research. And this is just get an idea of where you are now and what you're thinking about now before we've had a chance to discuss it. So if you are able to um, use a device and go to www.menti.com um, and enter the following code, um, it will come up with that research question and you can respond to it. I'm going to flip my screen to the Mentimeter now so that we can see your responses. And then let's just remind everyone that they can just type in the chat box if they need an alternative. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rhiannon and Kelly, if you're able to keep an eye on the chat function while I'm on the Mentimeter screen, that would be great. Um, is everyone finding that okay? So it can be it can be a, a under research population. It can be it can be any sort of evidence gap that you feel like it might be important to address now before we've had a chance to discuss. Um, so somebody said, how does COVID-19 impact upon the provision of DA services? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially now in this climate, um, that would certainly be a really important question um, to address, absolutely. Does anyone have anything else that they'd like to 
add um i mean it can be the same one um i suppose that would show how um how important it is if if more than one person says it um is there anything going on in the chat function there rihanna and kelly no. <laughs> <laughs> that's on the menti there <laughs> Um, so is there a service that can be provided to domestic abuse cases to prevent children being taken away by social services from mothers who have experienced domestic violence? That's a really good point. Um, and actually, um, I uh, before I was a researcher, I worked for um, Cardiff Women's Aid, and that was certainly something that in the children's team um, we, we talked about a lot. So yeah, thanks for raising that. Um, another one here, how can um, domestic abuse services, charity, third sector organisations and NHS services work more collaboratively? That's a really, really good point actually. Um, and um, something that we're really trying to explore a lot in the Health Pathfinder evaluation that we'll touch on um, briefly. Um, and another one here, Kat gaps with different protective characteristics yeah absolutely um so thinking, yeah more about um intersectionality and um, edi and, and those under research populations who who have um who absolutely need um responses as well honor based violence and associated issues yeah absolutely all really key questions, um, I think. And how are young people involved in the decision process? Mm. Priorities. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really good. I'm perhaps thinking about how we can, yeah, how we can do that. That would be a really good thing to explore in, in the breakout rooms as well. Are there any more? Um, um, any just put in the chat as well reiterating around gaps gaps in provision gaps for you know and different under you know under research groups and or groups that maybe don't have access to you know to particular services and now uh, here we go in particular um supporting 16 and 17 year olds exactly who may go on to be perpetrators and or victims yeah so i think really thinking about that cycle of violence there as well which is really important um yeah great thank you so much for that is there anything else anyone would like to raise that's been really um informative so thanks for that and i can imagine that that's what we're going to build on in those breakout sessions so that's been really really helpful um i'm going to sorry beth janice has just added as well um adult child um child mm -hmm. and violence um which is obviously I've, I've heard that quite a lot whilst um doing the health pathfinder evaluation um that that's a particular area that a lot of professionals feel needs to be explored absolutely yeah that's really interesting because when we've done um stuff before with school-based um interventions one of the issues the school that is emerging is um physical violence of children um, in relation to their parents. Um, and then it was spilling over into school-based violence. So definitely yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you so much everybody for your contribution to that activity. Um, and like I said, I think we'll really be building on that um, in the breakout sessions. And yet, Janice, like you said, appears to be increasing mostly. So yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. So what we'll do now um, is we're going to um, present those three studies that um, I briefly mentioned earlier. So I'm going to pass on to Kelly to um, first present the Duck trial, which took place in um, secondary schools. Thanks, Beth. Um, so yeah, so. The, um, the the first setting that we're going to kind of um, present some research that we've done some in in decipher in relation to um, a school based project um, which is called the Jack trial um, and so the first thing to think about is is the challenge that this research and this and this intervention is addressing um, and the project as a whole is it, it seeks to respond to the WHO's call for a direct focus on adolescent men in reducing teenage pregnancy 
Um, and this is the first trial that has been conducted of an intervention that proactively targets young men. Um, the UK has historically had one of the highest teenage pregnancy rates in Europe. Um, and previous research has pointed to a real gap in provision of high quality um, research and um, sorry, high quality um, RSE, um, so relationships and sexualities education and teaching resources that engage young men in particular. Um, so although the focus is on teenage pregnancy, the actual resource itself is a bit broader than that. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but the kind of the the sort of need that it's addressing is, you know, that there is a lot of evidence that suggests schools are a really important context in which sort of sex and, and relationships education happens. And recent sec uh, systematic reviews have shown that programmes that reach beyond the classroom can actually enhance effectiveness. So in particular factors such as parental monitoring and supervision and familial communication have all been associated with um, teenage sexual behaviours. Um, so teenagers, for example, who can recall a parent communicating with them about sex are more likely to report um, increased contraceptive use or even delaying sexual activity. Um, so while Jack is primarily focused on teenage pregnancy, it does take quite a holistic approach uh, and it addresses many other related issues then around gender stereotypes and roles, sexual consent, um, and unacceptable um, behaviour um, within sort of teenage relationships. And in the UK in 2013, Ofsted reported that 40% of schools were failing to provide high quality and age appropriate relationships and sexualities education, in part because of a lack of kind of tailored resources. So Jack aims to kind of fill this gap and provide a high quality, usable, detailed resource for teachers to engage pupils about sex relationships and pregnancy. So that challenge is a little bit broader. It's also about educating young people about healthy relationships, challenging harmful gender stereotypes that could possibly lead to abusive behaviours as well as unsafe sex. So if we move on to thinking about what the intervention um, actually is, um, the um, Intervention itself is a um, interactive video drama, so IVD for short, um, which tells the story of a 16 year old boy called Jack who gets his girlfriend Emma pregnant um, and they find themselves sort of um, discovering that they're pregnant and thinking about um, how they how they tell people and, and how they work through decisions about what to do. Uh, which is deliberately left um, up in the air. You never actually find out what they do decide to do um, because the idea is that the, the young people themselves receiving the intervention will, will kind of talk about and, and apply it to, to what they might do. Um, so the video itself promotes a kind of gender transformative approach by addressing teenage pregnancy by focusing on the male perspective. So it's told, the story is told through Jack's eyes. Um, and the resource is delivered by teachers um, to year 10 pupils uh, in a series of four lessons. So the first lesson is the actual video um, and then which is quite interactive. It stops and asks them what they might do at certain points and how they would feel at certain points. And then there are three other lessons that then um, have a, a range of activities that build on the video. Um, but like I said, go out a little bit more broadly and think about consent and other things. Um, so although it explicitly targets boys it's also delivered to girls um, and there's also a parental homework activity that aims to promote communication between teenagers and parents as well um, so there are a number of sort of other messages beyond pregnancy um, that the intervention aims uh, to deliver uh, which are around emphasising that relationships, sex and pregnancy can be positive experiences when they are mutually consensual and someone is ready and prepared for them. It aims to help young people interrogate their own personal attitudes and beliefs with regards to relationships, sex and pregnancy and how to effectively communicate these to others, uh, particularly in relation to examining the attitudes, values and beliefs of their family and their peers and the school ethos. Um, and as I said before, critically examining those gender norms and stereotypes associated with um, relationships, sex and pregnancy. So the actual trial, um, if we move on to the next slide, is just um, thinking, so the actual 
um, research into the intervention is a, uh, a trial methodology, which means that students um, filled in a survey before the intervention was delivered. Um, so we have 66 schools all across the UK. Half of them are randomised to deliver the intervention and the other half would deliver their normal uh, relationships and sexualities education. But all students were um, surveyed before it and then all students were surveyed um, after the intervention was delivered or after their um, usual um, education was delivered in the control schools. Um, so we're currently analysing that data at the moment to look at if there's any difference in outcomes um, between the um, students that received the intervention and the students that didn't. Um, we also conducted um, RSE surveys with all schools to find out what, what are they delivering, so the control schools and the intervention schools, what's their usual um, sort of package that they deliver. We conducted interviews and focus groups with teachers that delivered it, students that received it, um, parents um, in the intervention schools, as well as um, policy stakeholders and the teacher trainers that um, delivered the training to the teachers. Um, and we also, in those schools that delivered it, asked them to sort of keep good logs of, of their implementation of the um, interventions. So each session, what did they deliver? What didn't they deliver? Um, and how much resource did it take to do? So we've got lots of um, information about um, how they actually delivered it. And we also went in and observed um, a small sample of the lessons um, as well. So I think that's um, all for the JAP trial. I think Beth's now gonna talk a little bit about the health pathfinder evaluation that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, Cipher as well. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, um, Kelly. That was great. Um, so yes, I'm going to present to you the Health Path Finder evaluation project that we did in Decipher. Um, and this was looking um, at health, health-based um, settings. So there's four out of five survivors who will actually not call the police but almost all survivors will actually use health services um, and especially those with more complex needs. Um, so domestic violence and abuse is so prevalent in our, in our society um, that NHS staff will actually be in contact with both adult and child survivors um, but, and also perpetrators across the full range of health services. Um, and the mental and physical health consequences of domestic violence and abuse mean that um, the NHS spends more time um, trying to deal with and address the impact of domestic violence and abuse than almost any other sector um, and it's often the first po point of call for those survivors who are experiencing violence. Um, the cost of domestic violence and abuse um, to health services combined with uh, mental health service costs um, has been calculated at a total of 1.76 billion, um, which just shows that there's such a pressing need to find both cost effective and safe ways of uh, supporting survivors and responding to domestic violence and abuse. But yet the health service response to survivors is very variable um, and best practice is often, often um, short term um, and it's often depending on individual practitioners who are passionate at driving that change. So this is where Health Pathfinder comes in. Now the Health Pathfinder project um, was actually designed to transform healthcare responses to domestic violence and abuse by ensuring a coordinated and consistent approach um, across all areas of healthcare, including acute um, healthcare, um, mental health services and primary care services using multi-level system change approach across eight different sites. Now this took place from 2017 to 2020 and the funding actually came from the government first and foremost um, and it was used uh, by five consortium partners who are third sector organisations who were all addressing um, domestic violence and abuse um, and using strategic and operational direction they actually designed and developed uh, this intervention called Health, Health Pathfinder and this is what we looked to evaluate. 
So what actually was the intervention? What was Health Pathfinder? What did the five consortium partners develop? Um, and actually, because the development of the um, intervention wasn't done throughout a research um, consultation process, we actually needed to understand the intervention um, before we actually look to evaluate it. And the way that we did this is by um, creating a logic model. Now, a logic model, what you can see here on the screen, is a visual representation of an intervention. And it essentially depicts the relationships between the different intervention components and its intended outcomes. So it's meant to help clearly communicate different, the, the nature of the intervention um, to different people in a clear and concise way. So that's those who are delivering the intervention, those who are receiving it um, and uh, key stakeholders. Uh, so the goals and the outcomes that are desired and we want to accomplish through this intervention, how it might be achieved, um, are all made explicit in this uh, visual representation. Um, and the Health Pathfinder logic model that you see here was initially uh, developed uh, via the a review of the documentation. And then it was confirmed with key stakeholders in all of the eight sites, um, the five consortium partner sites that developed it um, and clinicians and victim survivors. What the crux of the intervention actually is, is essentially to improve the awareness, knowledge and skills of health professionals in order to increase their ability to routinely and sensitively inquire about domestic violence and abuse. So this was actually expected to lead to improvements in the quality of their responses um, to disclosure of domestic violence and abuse um, from survivors um, through earlier identification and referral to specialist services. Um, and it was expected that um, to actually increase um, the confidence of survivors to be able to disclose um, by having more of a positive experience um, when they told healthcare professionals. So how did we evaluate it? How did we evaluate this intervention? Um, well, we used a range of methods actually to answer this main primary research question, which was what was the effectiveness of Health Pathfinder as a model for improving the health service response to domestic violence and abuse? And the way that we did this was that we used that logic model, we developed that logic model through a consultation event so that we could see what the intervention is actually aiming to do. Um, we also um, did interviews with key professionals and service users so that we could think about what, what is the intervention going to achieve? Has it achieved what it wants to achieve? What is the acceptability and the feasibility of this model? Does it change over time? And do the, do the components achieve their desired outcomes? Um, in what context does the model work for and are there any unintended causal outcomes and we also set out to analyze um, the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of the intervention um, by using the uh, service administrative data uh, so that was more of the quantitative data of the impact and the findings of this report were actually due to be published in autumn so i'm now going to pass over um to uh Kelly, Kelly, are you talking about the Frida project or yeah, Rihanna? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Kelly's going to talk to you and present Frida now. So this um, this project is um, based in um, a third, the third sector, um, voluntary sector, um, and the challenge it's addressing is around um, children that witness um, or experience or are exposed to. Um, domestic violence within the family. So we know from research that 15% of UK children witness at least one form of DVA during childhood and 3% will have witnessed abuse in the previous 12 months. Um, and we know also that this is likely an, an undercount as well, um, given that children can be exposed to the detrimental impact of DVA in the family in a myriad of ways. So overhearing, witnessing the aftermath or disruptive parenting. 
Um, so exposure to DVA is the, the most frequently reported type of childhood trauma uh, and the most prevalent factor experienced by, um, identified by social workers when they are assessing children's needs. Uh, so children exposed to one incident of violence um, victimization are likely to be repeatedly exposed to the same type of violence and are at greater risk of experiencing multiple types of victimization as well. Um, so I think Kelly might have cut out. Kelly, are you still there? <laughs> Shall I just pick it up? Yeah, is that okay, Vianna? I'm sorry, I can't see anything because I'm yeah. sharing my screen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> sorry, everyone. Um, yeah, so I guess just to, to round that first um, slide. Um, on the last point really is that maternal mental health quality parenting um, and children's appraisals of risk um, need to be the target for intervention and to address these things. So we just move to the next slide. So what we were um, looking at was an evaluation or we just started the evaluation of um, what we call the FRIDA um, study. So what we're actually doing is looking at the CODA intervention or children overcoming domestic abuse. So it was originally developed um, in Canada in the last 20 years or so, um, but it's been wildly, ro widely rolled out in the UK. Um, so it targets children age seven to 11 and their parent who um, has experienced or been exposed to domestic violence. And then the child has obviously lived in that context, so has also been exposed to it. Um, the nature of the relationship is that it primarily um, looks at the mum and um, the children, but there is some consideration about um, same-sex relationships. And one of the things that we are looking at is about feasibility and the appropriateness of this type of intervention for fathers. So there has um, this sort of a feminist orientation to a lot of the services within which CODA is delivered. Um, and that there are women only services, but there is consideration about what about men who um, experience this. So we are looking through that. So um, during the duration of study, um, the CODA intervention in Wales is going to be delivered um, through Cardiff Women's Aid, but the study will also run um, in different sites in England um, and it's the interventions being delivered there through AVA. Um, and essentially what it is, is a number of um, interactive sessions, which are based around sort of psychosocial dynamics. Um, so children and parents go and they take part in activities with other mums and children who have experienced domestic um, violence, and they learn things about, um, around emotional management, resilience, etc. cetera. Um, the thing which was quite interesting for us is that this sort of session-based, almost like therapeutic approach is embedded in a really complex system um, through which loads of different organisations can refer mums and children into these sessions. So what we're almost more interested in is how does the Welsh community, um, particularly around Cardiff, work to make referrals to this um, intervention and how are different organisations joined up in achieving this end. So could you just go to the next slide, Kelly? Um, back on, sorry. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> sorry. So um, in terms of the research that we were doing, so we are running what's called a feasibility trial. So before um, finding out if the intervention is effective or not, which is going to be the next study we'll do, at this point what we're trying to figure out is can we actually deliver the intervention? And this has become really important in the context of COVID because everything was originally done in person and now things are having to move online and we don't know if the intervention can work in the same way when it's delivered online. We're key to that sort of psychotherapeutic process is the interaction between the mother, the child, but also um, that parent-child dyad with other 
um, children and mothers. So we are figuring out, is it feasible to deliver this online? Can it still work? And then also, can we do a full proper evaluation of this to find out if it works in the same way that um, Kelly talked about the Jack study, really? So the main questions that we're asking is, is the code intervention acceptable to the people who take part in it? And can we feasibly deliver it? But also, can, is it feasible to do an evaluation of something this complex? Um, so as part of the feasibility study, we are um, looking at 32 mums in England and in Wales, and we're going to measure their outcomes before taking part and afterwards, just to see, are these the right outcomes that we're looking at? Um, and then we're going to look at the processes. So asking those questions about how did you feel about taking part? Did you like it? But also um, asking the different organisations, how did they coordinate to refer people to the service? Did that work for them? Are there ways of enhancing how this whole thing operates? So, um, yeah, I think that, that's good for the Frida study. Perfect. Thanks, Rhiannon. Um, and those are just the funding statements uh, that correspond with the um, with the studies that we have just presented.